Father in heaven, we ask that you bless our time together now as we think about the scriptures and these matters. Give me wisdom in what to say and all of us ears to hear what should be heard. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, in your notebooks, we're on page 15 for my one lecture on two days. From Land to City. This has been a, a general interest of mine for the last 40 years or so since I was in seminary. I, I mapped out doing papers on the Garden of Eden theme in the Bible and shortly you discover that the garden, there are gardens in the Bible. Jesus is resurrected in one, uh, which begins again uh, the story of the world with a woman who comes to him and uh, so forth. But uh, you find right away that the garden becomes these architectural forms like the tabernacle and the temple over time and then becomes city forms as well. Uh, and as my investigations went further, I discovered that uh, in the, under the law, uh, the cities are holier ground than the land. If you uh, contract what our Bibles call leprosy uh, inside a city wall, if you're house gets green or red blotches on it, uh, it's going to have to be dealt with. Out in an unwalled villages, village, that makes no difference whatsoever. Uh, lepers, people afflicted with the same kind of skin disease, have to stay outside the city walls. They can live in villages. Uh, so there are differences between land and city and in the Bible, we move from land to city. After all, the Bible opens with land and garden in the world and ends with city in the world. What has happened is this threefold world that we have in the beginning, a world with lands in it, including the land of Eden and the garden on the east side of Eden, that has become, over time, a world with a city garden in it, which is a pyramid inside of a cube, all right? And that is the city of God, which is a city in the world. So you have the nations outside, they're bringing their gold and whatnot into it, but the, the sanctuary and the city are the same place, which is the movement of history, and that we're not going to get to that situation until after the final judgment. But that is a movement in history. The city, therefore, is eschatological in the sense that it comes in time. It is not what you have in the beginning. It's, so to speak, the glorified form of the world. Cities are feminine in the Bible. And uh, just as the woman is the glory of the man, you'll remember from all of our previous courses, when the man is created, he's called Adam, which means dirt bag, man of earth. And once the woman is made, he's called Ish, because that comes from the fire and she lights his fire. Uh, he's on fire, she's called Isha. Those are glory words. The altar of earth, God's fire has fallen upon it. They have been Pentecostalized with fire. They are symbolized by candles on the altar in the church, lit on fire, the original purpose, person. And the woman is the glory of the man, provides the uh, second iteration of the human life. She adds to man, men are pioneers and women are glorifiers. And that is the essential difference between men and women. Well, the essential difference between men and women is the difference between the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Spirit proceeds from the Son and brings glory. Uh, and so that is the ultimate root of why men and women are different. And, of course, the modern view is that men and women are the same. The only difference is plumbing. So you can have women pastors and you can, men can marry each other and so forth and so on. In our religion, the difference goes all the way down and it's grounded in the second and third person of the Trinity. Um, so the city is eschatological. She is daughter Zion, daughter Jerusalem, and she grows up to be the bride of Christ. 
in the book of Revelation. I will show you the bride of Christ, and I saw the city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. Now, in terms of the city being eschatological, in the Bible that means it comes into existence over time by stages, death and resurrection stages. Rich was talking about this this morning, and you'll remember that God didn't just say to Adam, stand still, I'll pull a rib out and make a woman. He put him into death sleep, and while he's there, he rips him in half, and then he raises him up again and reunites him. The two are one flesh, but reunited in a different way, and now their names are changed from Adam to Ish and Isha. Okay, that process of evening and morning, of death and resurrection, of deep sleep and coming back up again, that brings the eschatological existence progressively into being. You don't get a man as a, as a true king with the right to exercise capital punishment until you go through the death and resurrection of the flood. Then you have a man on the top of the mountain. Then he can plant a garden. Then he can leave the garden and see what his sons do while he's gone. Then he can come back to the garden and pass judgments that are going to be the judgments that go down through history. He now can do all the things that God did in the beginning. Okay, That's what Noah can do because he's been through this death and resurrection thing that brings him forward eschatologically. So eschatology is not something that happens bang at the end and everything else is just interesting stuff along the way. Okay. And then we have to say this against <clears throat> the basic thesis of dialectical theologian Jacques Ellul uh, in his book, uh, The Nature of the City, right? Meaning. meaning of the city, meaning of the city. I knew I'd mess it up if I didn't write it down, and sure enough, I did. Okay, he has all kinds of interesting things to say about the city, but for Ellul, the city is made by Cain, and it's always pretty much a bad place. And uh, we're going to have a good city at the end, but... Not until the end. It's always going to be bad. It's always fallen and corrupt, essentially. And this eschatology is otherworldly, or, to be fair, super is at the end of history after a final judgment and not in progressive manifestations. For us, biblically, they're progressive manifestations as a result of these crises in history. For Christian theology, the city is the new possibility, the new challenge within history. And that's what we were talking about during the last hour uh, with AK and the rest of us. We're talking about, okay, all these new things have come into the world. The television has come into the world. The internet has come into the world. Uh, phonograph records have come in. Wait a minute, there are things beyond that. Uh, electric typewriters have come into the world. And, uh, you cannot change that. Super high road, highways have come into the world. Uh, there might be a desire to take the super highways out that run through the middle of the city, but I doubt if that's going to happen. People are still going to want to get from one end to the other fast and be able to get off along the way, uh, you know. So uh, even though you understand the desire to regardenize or re-neighborhood a city, uh, we're going to have to figure out some creative ways to do that because these things are here and once they come in they don't go away unless civilization totally collapses and uh, I don't think we can just count on that's happening. <laughs> so the city gives us these new possibilities, new challenges and as we'll see as we go along every new invention, every new challenge is always misused and abused to start with. Okay. The internet, what's the first thing it's for? Pornography. Then we begin to find some better uses. YouTube, put up some get decent stuff on there. Every, every con concert and art museum tour ever made is on YouTube. Okay, well, I can see that. All kinds of good sermons and everything else are up there, but that isn't where the internet started for most people. Cat videos, yeah. Revitalizing humor in America. The city being eschatological magnifies and matures both devilish corruption and divine glory. So we have new possibilities of wickedness such as pornography and then modern weapons, 
It's all technological stuff, city stuff, propaganda. Again, a major problem. The ability through advertising, uh, through modern media to sway people's minds. I see this in Russia because I have been going to Russia since the time when the uh, mass media was completely taken over by the government. No independent, independent media anymore. Khodorkovsky and all the guys who had different kinds of points of view, in jail. Okay? And so our Russian uh, students and all, the only news they ever hear is state propaganda. They, they have no idea what's going on in the Ukraine. What they know is that the Ukrainians were rounding up innocent Russian people and murdering them. Those things have been staged in, uh, for the, and filmed, and that's what they know. And it's only those who have contact with you know, us and with American media who can even find out anything else. So you, you find out that this ability to control uh, propaganda and media is a new possibility of wickedness. Uh, it's in China or in the United States, uh, who knows? I mean, you, you begin to be doubtful about what you're getting on the news, and after a while you don't trust anything anymore, and then, then you're in a bad way because it's not all untrustworthy. Then. But we have new possibilities of glory as well in the, in the city. You can have a symphony orchestra. You have enough people living together in a city to have a whole bunch of instruments together in the room at the same time. They're not living out on farms. And you can perfect um, the instruments to where they can play in the same key with one another. You know, there, there are no concertos for bagpipe and orchestra. Because a, bag, a bagpipe is not tuned to the same scales exactly as, as uh, these instruments. These modern instruments that we have have all been created to work together with one another. And those that don't work very well, like a saxophone, don't get used very much. And those that don't work at all, like bagpipes, don't get work used at all. In a city, you can have glorious architecture. You wouldn't build a large cathedral-type building out in the woods somewhere. Uh, you're going to build it in a city. You can do education in the city at a far more advanced level because you can have a lot of people together. And you ha can have enough money together in one place to pay for teachers to become expert. And so you can develop in the Middle Ages the University of Paris or the University of London. Now, it's just Paris. It's just London. You know, they're not in every little podunk town like they are in America today. But you can have it, all right? And the fact that we can have uh, advanced education, corrupt as it may be today, all over the place in locations, you know, how many colleges and, and universities are in the state of Alabama? Hundreds, of course, you know, that the whole state has become kind of cityfied in that respect. And now you can go online and do it. So new possibilities of glory exist in the city as well, uh, beyond what's available in the land. So that's part of what the city being eschatological means. It magnifies and matures both the devilish corruption and the divine glory. It can go either way. What we have over the years called the Enoch factor means that the wicked make the first city. And that's in Genesis 4. The 4 got cut off, I see. Someone cut my 4 off. All right. Enoch goes out under God's judgment, and he's told he's going to be in a land of wandering. And he says, I am not going to wander. I'm going to force something down on the ground. I am going to make a city. I'm going to be divine, and I'm going to draw lines on the ground. Space. And inside this space, I am the God. And I have a son, and I will name the city after him, and he will be my junior God and assistant. And this city will be his bride. Now this, whether he realized it or not, is an imitation of what God has done. And Enoch does this, 
sets up his boundary. If you want to understand a little bit more about this, the best way to understand it is with Romulus and Remus. Okay, right? Right? Romulus plows his land, says, this is mine. Nobody can be in here without my permission. Remus disobeys him and Romulus kills him just like that. And that's the great Roman founding myth. The first half of it is that they were raised by wolves. <laughs> you don't want to mess with Rome. They're descended from wolves. <laughs> and the second half is they murdered their brother uh, because he disobeyed us and came into our city without permission. There are various versions of that myth, but that tells you something about the ancient world and how it thinks. And it starts here in Genesis 4. We see it. And as was said this morning, after you take care of a deep-seated psychological problem, you feel good. You got energy, man. We have scapegoated the scapegoat. We've killed him. Now we feel good. Jesus is dead. Ding dong. Jesus is dead. Dead, dead, dead. And now we feel good. And these apostles are continuing to bring him up. We're going to call him in and, and flog him so they shut up because they're killing our good feelings. We're having a party here. Well, Cain felt good after he killed Abel. All of his tensions were gone. All of his energy is released so he can build a city. Violence against those that you deem to be guilty releases cultural energy on the short haul. The righteous don't have that as an option for releasing cultural energy. And so the descendants of Seth don't become the builders of a big civilization before the flood. It's the daughters of men in this civilization who have got all the neat stuff. They've got the perfume and the jewelry and the musical instruments. Uh, Lamech's sons developed the musical instruments and they've got met metallurgy. They've got gold rings and everything. And the sons of God out here looking at this culturally superior civilization and they want to intermarry with it they start that in the days of Enoch. We have Enoch's prophecy about how the people are going in ungodly ways, rejecting God. And so then we have to have the flood and start over again. The wicked get there first. And after the flood, the second passage I read to you today, uh, we see that Nimrod goes out and builds cities. He builds the Tower of Babel and some other cities associated with it. And then it says he went out and built Nineveh. Uh, because <laughs> something happened to Babel. Uh, we find that out in the following chapter. And he builds Nineveh and a couple of other cities, and it says they are together the great city. So what we have to start with is Babel, Erech, a couple of other cities like this. The second time, the cities are all together as one larger unit. Um, that move is also eschatological, although it's a counterfeit. In the Adamic human world, sin comes first, salvation and glory come after. Uh, and from Genesis 4, we see technological advance comes with the city. It's this city world, uh, just to remind us once, once again of what the passage says, develops in this city world. Uh, Verse 16 of Genesis 4, Cain went out from the presence of Yahweh and settled in the land of wandering east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Hanach, Enoch. And he built a city. And, you know, you can, because this is a city course, we'll do this again. We start with this word, Hanach. Okay, we find that the Babylonians have this word unuk, and then the n becomes r. If you look at your tongue, n r, your tongue is in the same place. So the n becomes an r, uruk, uruk, uruk. The u, u sound is the same as the w sound, w, u. It's the same sound, isn't it? 
Yes, Jim, it's the same sound. Ooh, woo. Uruk becomes warak. Wuh, puh, wuh, puh. Your mouth is doing the same thing. That becomes perg. Ah, now we're into Greek. Puh, buh, buh, puh. Same sound, right? Just voiced. That becomes berg. Really true. I didn't make this up. I got it from Arthur Customs. All right? Enoch to Berg. We still got the same word today. After 75,000 years, we still have the same word. Or not. Well, he built a city and called the name of the city Berg after the name of his son. Now to Enoch was born Irad, city dweller. Irad became the father of Mehujah El, he who attacks Yahweh Elohim. And he who attacks Yahweh Elohim became the father of Methushah El, he who kills the peace of God. And Methushah El became the father of Lamech, the king. Melech reversed a little bit to Lamech. Lamech took to himself two wives. The name of the one was Ornament, and the name of the other was Pretty Voice. And Ornament gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock, priestly type guy. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of those who play the lyre and the pipe, a kingly type guy. And Pretty Voice gave birth to Tubal, Cain, which comes down to us here in Birmingham, is Vulcan, Tubal, Vulcan. To Balkain, Balkain, Vulcan, the forger of implements of bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was sweet singer. All right, and Lamech sings this song Ada and Zillah, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech, give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, Lamech seventy sevenfold. All right. And Jesus says to forgive 70 times sevenfold, all right? So Jesus says that's not enough, still, still should forgive. All right, now, this is a civilization. It's a civilization where the experts in animal husbandry are over here in the first civilization, the civilization of Enoch, where the musical instruments are over here, the developed musicians and singers are over here, the choirs and orchestras are over here. So that's develops first. But of course, all this stuff is going to come up with David, isn't it? David is going to invent musical instruments. David is going to set up singers. David is going to compose psalms. But that's later. The wicked get there first. And it's a principle we always have to remember as Christians. Don't be surprised at it. But don't be dismayed at it. Either. Technological advance comes with the city. And I've got up here at the top of page 17, all human maturation involves technolo technological advance because the tool is the extension of the human person in the same way that the spirit is the extension of the sun. I'm going to repeat that because it's underlined. The tool is the extension of the human person in the same way that the spirit is the extension of the sun. All tools do is glorify and extend who we are and what we can do. Okay? A hoe makes it a lot easier to cultivate the soil than fingers do. And a trowel makes it easier to plant a plant than fingers do. And all musical instruments are amplifications of the voice. Percussive instruments, stringed instruments from your vocal cords, and wind instruments from your pipe. Everything we have extends us, technical advance, and they are all outflows from us in the way the Spirit outflows from the sun. The Spirit glows from the sun to bring glory into the world. Technological advance goes from us to bring glory into the world. We dig up gold ore 
and then we have technological advance to smelt it down and get the gold out of it and make something beautiful out of gold, right? We learn how to build an oven, a technological thing, and then we learn how to make nice fine flour and we learn how to make butter and we learn how to make yeast and we can get some eggs and we can make a pound cake. Pound of flour, pound of butter, pound of eggs, pound of yeast, pound of sugar. I don't know, however you make a pound cake. <laughs> Technological advance enables you to do these things and to glorify the world with cake instead of flat pita bread. All right. Now, every technological advance shortens time, expands space, and dislocates or relocates people. And I'm not sure about that. The third one is true, but I got the first two from Rosen, Eugen Rosenstock Husey, and I think the third one is what he says, too. Do you remember? Yeah. That's Okay, it destroys the relevant social group. Okay, it shortens time. Technological advance, like a vacuum cleaner. It takes a lot less time to vacuum with a vacuum cleaner than it does to sweep out a house. And it's much more efficient, okay? If you've got a uh, five-story house like the Archimandrite has with 45 rooms in it, you can get those rooms cleaned up a lot faster with a vacuum cleaner than with a broom. Now, it expands space because the parts that go into a vacuum cleaner come from here, there, and everywhere. If I'm going to make a broom, all i got to get is some straw and some string and a pole, and I can tie it all up and snip it off, and yeah, I've got myself a broom. Okay, but a vacuum cleaner, I'm going to have to get some rubber parts from wherever rubber comes from, or plastic nowadays, and then metal, different kinds of metal, and uh, bushings, and all the other things that go into making one, and they're going to come from different places to one place and be put together. It expands space, the amount of space needed to make an automobile uh, is greater, even though it shortens time. And finally, it dislocates people. Now, the vacuum cleaner doesn't have such an extent of that, but new inventions like this, te technological advances, force people out of their old jobs. One of the elders for years in the church that we attended in Florida uh, was a cash register repairman because back when stegosaurs roamed the earth and I was young, when you went to the grocery store, uh, the, the price of things was on here and the, the lady that was a clerk behind the counter, she would look at it and she would punch in numbers here and bang the thing and the number would go click, 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 click. And this was all mechanical, okay? Then she grabbed the next one. She didn't have to look at these numbers. Click, 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 click. And that was click, 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 click. And they could do it at the speed of light. Well, he could fix these things. Then they started doing them with computers. They had to go up to Dayton, Ohio, the NCR National Cash Register, and learn how to fix how to replace computer parts. And then they started scanning things in. They had those scan bars on. Have you ever seen those scan bars that are on things they have now? Ever seen those? They're amazing. And now they can just scan them and he couldn't fix them anymore. That was it. It was out of work. All she wrote. So he was dislocated. He started selling light bulbs. Fortunately, he was old enough to be close to retirement, so it it didn't exact. He wasn't, you know, in his early 30s when this happened to him. But it relocates people in where they are and what they have to do. That's what technolo technology does, and that is God's plan to move people around so that people don't get settled in to one place and just get rooted in in one place in time. God wants people moving forward. Now, the shift from land to city is a shift from living largely with animals to living largely with people. I'm trying to talk fast because I've got a lot of notes in here and I want to get through it all. So I've got here Deuteronomy versus the epistles. Read Deuteronomy. There's all these laws about how you deal with animals. 
Don't yoke an ox and an ass together. Well, why not? Who in his right mind would ever do so? Can you imagine plowing with an ox and an ass yoked together? It's not doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Maybe you could do it. Maybe I don't understand it very well. Don't muzzle the ox while he treads out the corn. Well, if you don't muzzle him, he's just going to stop and eat. So in a sense, you've got a law there that goes somewhat, you think, wait a minute, this is, this is really talking about something else, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's talking about people and the levered husband. I won't go into that. But these rules are here. In Exodus, if an ox gores another ox, the first ox is sold. If the ox was in the habit of goring before, and there are all these rules about goring oxen. What does that got to do with? What's a goring ox? Your teenage son? Oxen in the Bible are nations. You know, Psalm 51 says, you know, after David repents, then they will bring young bullocks onto your altar. Uh, then they will bring nations to your place of communion, is what that means. Oxen goring oxen. Is that how God will treat nations? What wisdom is there? But they're all about animals because you live with animals. If a man steals uh, your donkey and kills it or sells it off, he's got to make twofold restitution. If he steals your sheep and kills it and eats it, he's got to make fourfold restitution. It's all about animals. Read the epistles of Paul. There's nothing about animals. It's all about how you get along with people. Now, if you think it's hard to get along with mules and donkeys, try getting along with people, okay? People are worse. And the cities, you see, are full of people. Uh, out on the land, you're basically, you can live out there with your family, and you're not all that close to other people all the time. But you are living much more closely with people in a city. And part of the themes of this legislation from God, from Moses and then from Paul, um, is that contrast. Now under the archaic religion, which in the Bible is the Torah, which is the true form of archaic religion, angels disciple people by means of stars, animals, and taboos. And this is true everywhere. If a society lives in a place where they can see the sky, then they will pay attention to the stars. If they live under a canopy of trees and they live with animals, as the American uh, autochthonous people here did and as people in Africa did, uh, they live with animals. But the animals become ways in which they learn. And angels come in the Ur time and teach them which things they can eat and which things are medicinal. And the angels continue to come and they meet with the tribal leader uh, who's read Things Fall Apart by Achebe? Okay, remember, Okonkwo goes into the sacred cave, and during the night, the spirits reveal to him where the missing child is. Okay, that stuff is real. I've had missionaries tell me that stuff. And the missionaries will also say, once I came and people started to get converted, the chief says, it doesn't work for me anymore. Okay, angels were helping out. Good, bad, and, and uh, we don't know all the details of how this worked, we're not supposed to because we live in the new age. All right, but it did. And taboos, taboos of space. You better not go over there because that's a holy space and therefore it's dangerous. Only the chief can go into the sacred cave and spend the night and dream. You better not try to do that. All right. Uh, then there are taboos of sex, uh, what you can do to whom and when, taboos of time. Uh, special chaos times, festival times, forbidden times, uh, space time, food, and signs on the skin of your body. And all that stuff's in Leviticus in its true form. But taboos have the effect of preventing people from going hog wild. Taboos are boundaries in society. And when a society has a lot of little ritual taboos like that, they're channeled. They're kept from going too far. When the gospel comes, things fall apart and all that stuff stops 
and you either get caught by the gospel or you have destructive type stuff happen. Uh, under the archaic religion, that's what's going on. Angels are teaching us through these things, and it's what you see in the Bible. These are the animals you bring. This is how you put them to death. You read the book of Proverbs, learn from all these different animals. Uh, this is what the kinds of, there are nine different kinds of skin conditions that are listed in Deuteronomy 13. If you're a priest, you got to know how to recognize all these different kinds and what they mean. Uh, these are the animals you can eat. These are the animals you can eat at some such and such a time. If you bring a, a communion office offering for peace, you can eat the uh, meat on the day you bring it and to the Lord, and you can eat the leftovers the next day, but on the third day, you can't eat it anymore because the holiness that you reached up to by that sacrifice has begun to diminish, and you better not fool around with that meat on the third day. It's still holy and too dangerous for you. But if it's a Thanksgiving offering, like the Lord's Supper, you have to eat it on that day. If you try to eat it the second day, you've already slipped back and it's dangerous for you. All these rules about what you can eat, when, all the rest. And that was a way of teaching and a way of discipleship. These are ways, rituals, paths that you walk. And uh, this is not the course for that, but of course these rituals, you are walking through the history of Israel. When you walk through the Ascension offering, you are walking through the Exodus from Egypt and coming to Mount Sinai and Moses going up on top of the mountain. And all those things are being recapitulated in a compact symbolic form. Okay. Rituals recapitulate founding events in a sacred place and in a microcosm of time, a microcron of time and in a microcosm of God's temple. Okay? They recapitulate founding events so that you walk, if you have fallen out of the benefits of Sinai, you can walk through that again symbolically in a little ritual that doesn't take very much time and it takes place in a sacred space that is a replica of God's cosmic temple and then you can be brought back into the benefits of Sinai. That's what these rituals are. Now, in the new creation, turning the page, human beings disciple people by means of the application of the completed word. Stars, animals, and taboos have lost meaning. There are no taboo times. There are no taboo animals. There may be animals that will make you sick, but... They're not taboo. We don't know how to read the stars anymore. People in the ancient world did. But we don't. Somebody asked me in church a couple of weeks ago, now, what do you think of this gospel and the stars stuff, these 19th century books? I said, well, I understand the motive behind it because people in the ancient world and in Israel and the nations around Israel did know what the constellations are. And when you see that the, uh, the zodiacal constellations are stuff like a bull, a lion, a goat, a sheep, a scales, a virgin giving birth. Well, that looks kind of familiar, doesn't it? Okay, but there's one thing that's true about constellations. They don't look anything at all like what they're supposed to be. They're totally arbitrary. Don't let anybody ever tell you otherwise. Cast, you know, what we call the Big Dipper is actually part of the Big Bear at You'll never see a bear there. Uh, see that? That's Cassiopeia lying on her couch. See that? Oh, that's obvious. You know, people all around the world, when they looked at that, they say, oh, that's a woman lying on a couch. <laughs> no, they didn't. You see, somebody came up with that, and it went all around the ancient world, and the meanings were assigned. But we're not supposed to know that anymore. We've got the completed word. And so modern discipleship in the city is exclusively by the Word, and it's applied by human beings. We are now the elders. 
in the old in the archaic time the people who served God in a special way and were in charge of the religious life of the people were called Cohen. And Peter has shown that what this means is a servant of a royal household. Or we say to just keep it short, palace servant. Joseph, for instance, married the daughter of the priest of the city Heliopolis. Well, that means the royal governor, all right? Uh, not a pagan god priest. Uh, the royal governor of the city of Heliopolis. Well, these same people doing essentially the same job in the New Testament are called presbyters, which means elder. In the book of Revelation, the, ar the archangels who ruled the Old Testament were called elders. Now, these servants have become elders. Under the law, angels gave the law. And the Kohanim simply read the law and did what it said. You read in, in Leviticus, it just tells you what to do. It doesn't leave you any discretion. There's no wisdom involved. If a man has a white spot on his arm and you can see white hair in it, then the priest is to put him aside for a week and come back and look again. And if it has grown, then he is to pronounce him unclean and he is to go outside the camp. Now, it's, it's all written out for you. How exactly do you do the sacrifices? It's all spelled out as if you were a child and the angels who gave the law, always the law was given by angels, have spelled out to you as a child, as a servant, what you're supposed to do. In the New Testament, these same people are called elders. They now preside at the, tavern, at the uh, temple uh, of the church. They uh, are the words who are the official teachers of the Word of God. They are the ones who supervise the sacramental meals. All right. Now, they're the new angels in the book of Revelation calls them angels. So that's a shift, and that is a city shift, okay? Now, on page 19, we begin to look at biblical themes, time permitting. Shifts in imagery from the old to the new, from the pre-glorious to the glorious, from the land world to the city world, all right? What happens? First of all, this shift in imagery, and just to remind you, we move from sheep to fish. Any fishermen uh, among the Yahweh's disciples in the Old Testament? No. Any shepherds among Jesus' disciples? No. Jesus calls himself a good shepherd. The last time we actually see any shepherds is when Jesus is born. That's it. There are no more shepherds around. Fish, that's Gentile world. In fact, fortuitously, luckily, our noon reading was about uh, Jesus' new kingdom going to the entire world, going to the sheep of the land, to the fish of the sea. More importantly, we have the shift from land, for our purposes, we have the shift from land to city. In the older time, we have letters to lands written by the prophets. We see these letters in the prophets, okay? Jeremiah's got a whole selection of letters sent to various kingdoms. Uh, to the king of Moab, say this. To the king of so-and-so, say that. Primarily to Israel and Judah, the letters go. In the new covenant, the letters go to cities. No letters to any lands. Letters go to cities. Countries are reached by land, cities by sea. The only example of that we had before is Jonah. Okay? Jonah goes by sea to reach the Gentile city of Nineveh. That's the only sea passage we have. And once we get to Paul, Paul is always going places by sea. And at the end, he's going uh, to Rome by sea, and the Roman ship sinks, which is a sign of the end of the old world. You reach the cities by sea. You don't have to, okay? But that's the, 
that's the way the imagery is set out. Um, okay. Jonah goes to Nineveh. Paul and New Jonah goes to cities. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about is the city is now a fact. It's not a possibility. Okay. It's a, it is a fact. Uh, we know uh, that the New Jerusalem descends from heaven in the year 70 A.D. It is now city time, no longer land time. All of our dispensational brothers and all the rest who uh, want to say that God gave the land to the Jews and it's still their land and God makes land promises, it's all gone. That was fulfilled. The Jews got all their land and then it was taken away from them when they went into exile and God gave them another holy land and they blew it and uh, it left in the year 70 A.D. under the Roman conquest. And that's it. Everything is city now. What God promises now is not land, but city. So, just to summarize the progression, we have Jesus as priest, uh, his earthly life, uh, the time of the ox. Uh, Matthew is the book there. Jesus as lion, as king of Israel. We see in Acts 1-12 to and in Mark, um, uh, I don't have time to go through all this. It's there in your notes. You can look at it. Eagle, Jesus is prophet of the Oikumene of the empire, Acts 13 to 28. And that's the sinking of the Roman ship there at the end of that. And Paul says, if you want to come with me, if you want to live. Uh, and so the people get off the boat when Paul says to, after he serves them the Lord's Supper at midnight, another Passover, and they come up on the land, and they are no longer in the Oikomene. They are with a bunch of barbarians who don't speak Greek. And they have other gods. We have now moved out of the Oikomene into what the New Testament calls the Ketesis. Okay? The Babelic world. Ah! Ketesis. All right? And that's, that's essentially the shift that's happening right at the end of Acts. Now, you know, this island is still actually technically within the Roman Empire, but it's no longer culturally or conceptually part of the divine kingdom that God has set up. We have moved out from the book of Daniel and its four kingdoms into the wider Babelic world. And then finally we have Jesus as man, husband of the city, and that's in Revelation 21 and 22 after the year 70. And the Gospel of John throughout has that as its concern. So the city is here now, okay? The, uh, the tribal time is gone. The kingdom of Israel is gone. The oikumene that God set up in the book of Daniel, uh, the empire with its four administrators is gone. And now the city is what's here. Now the city is not a mere symbol. The city is cosmopolitan because it's a place of foreigners. Oh, I may, may get through this. In the Old Covenant also, the land is for Israel. The cities are for foreigners. Uh, if you move to Israel, we'll probably have to come back to this. I like that clock back there better. Uh, under the law, when the people came into the land in the book of Joshua, it was all divided up and given to uh, Hebrew, Israelite now, the Israelite is the new name, Israelite families. Each one gets its plot of land, which can never be sold. Remember Naboth says, I can't sell my vineyard. It's the land God gave me. Uh, you can lease it out, but every 49 years it goes back to you. Not people say, we want this Jubilee law today. No, you don't. Okay. Every, every 49 years, you take it all away from the immigrants and give it back to the people who are already here. I mean, it's a stupid idea. Okay. Jubilee did not mean land re redistribution. It meant actually the opposite. And so the result was, if you were a foreigner and you moved to Israel and you wanted to come under Yahweh's wings uh, as the book of Exodus says, if, if a servant of another nation comes and places himself under Yahweh's wings, you will not return him to his master. 
that's not just a fugitive slave law. It's actually more the idea of fleeing from another kingdom. Uh, but either way, if he's coming and he wants sanctuary in Israel, you don't let him go back. But where is he going to live? Unless he is adopted into an Israelite family, and as a ritual for that called the circumcision of the ear, unless he is adopted in, he has to live in the cities. The city becomes a place where foreigners live. Uh, yeah. And so it's a mixed place and a dangerous place. The cities initially uh, can be good, can be bad. We find uh, the cities at the end of the book of Judges, the city of Gibeah, it's got some sons of Belial in there. They're not very friendly. They raped that young woman to death. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13, in giving the rules about cities or about apostates, uh, chapter 13, first paragraph, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign of wonder, and the sign of wonder or wonder comes true, and he says, now let's go worship other gods. You won't listen to him. God, always, God is testing you, and you will purge evil away from you. And then second paragraph, verse 6, if your brother, your mother's son, or your son, or the wife you cherish, or your best friend says, let's go worship other gods, the gods of the people around you. You will not listen to him. Uh, your eye shall not pity him. You will kill him. Your hand will be first against him and stone him to death. Okay? Pretty strong stuff. And then in verse 12, the third paragraph, if you hear in one of your cities that Yahweh your God is giving you to live in, someone saying that some sons of Belial have gone out from among you and seduced the inhabitants of their city, saying, let's go serve other gods whom you have not known. You will investigate and search the matter out. If it's true, you will strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, and so forth and so on. In other words, there are dangers in the city because there are foreigners, potential idolaters living there. But it can also be a good place, the city can. As we see in Psalm 87, speaking of Jerusalem, but giving us... Uh, the positive side of the city as a place for refugees. Psalm 87. His foundation is in the holy mountain. Yahweh loves the gates of Zion more than the dwelling places of Jacob. The city is preferred. Of course, it's the city of Jerusalem. Glorious things are spoken of you, city of God. I will mention Rahab, that's Egypt, and Babylon among those who know me. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia. This one was born there. That means these people now say, God says, th these people were born in Zion. They are adopted in. Of Zion it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her. Most high himself will establish her. The Lord shall count when he registers the peoples. This one was born there. All these people are now inhabitants of Zion. You know, the song, Blessed Inhabitants of Zion, the hymn that we sing is based on this. All right. Uh, so if, if you are a true convert and you go to the cities, that's a wonderful place. The cities uh, anticipate the new creation because they are holier ground. They're not under the Jubilee laws. The land in the city does not revert every 49 years. If it's sold and you buy it, uh, it's yours forever. Just like the world today, all right? Okay, these Jubilee laws don't apply anymore. Uh, now, all the world, all the land that's in the world, all this countryside out here is under the city rules. It's under the rules of cities, walled or fenced cities, all right? If a city has a wall around it, okay, a city here, if it's got a wall around it or even a fence around it, that is a space that is under different rules, okay? Not, it's not land. And the land, people are not given pieces of land there. They don't revert in the 49th year uh, or in the 50th year, depending on how you want to express that. And so they anticipate the new creation and the way we live now. 
Similarly, old Jerusalem, the Jerusalem of David, originally the Jerusalem of Melchizedek. You know, you might ask the question, how did David know that Jerusalem was where he should go and make it his capital? Because it was the city of Melchizedek, all right? Who was the priest king who was higher than Aaron? Um, Jethro, uh, Noahic priest king from the Melchizedek uh, line of establishment, is the one who blesses the Mosaic covenant and sets up its order of government. Okay, so that's the higher order of things. And Melchizedek is priest and king of Jerusalem, and David knows Jerusalem is the place that's God's ordained capital of the, place, of the city, of the, of the land. And so old Jerusalem anticipates the new creation. It's the place where there's a temple. It's a place where the entire city is holy. It's a place where there's an orchestra. It's a place where there's a choir. And uh, tomorrow we will return to this. Uh, here on page 21, city life is not under the elementary principles.